our PSP launch postmortem, or a tale of two titles, or what it takes for you and for us to survive launch. My name is Matt Conti. I was uh, lead programmer on Spider-Man 2 PSP. Uh, to my immediate left is Aaron Ondek. He was uh, lead programmer on Asylum. And to his left is Brian Osman, our PSP graphics programmer. Uh, our talk today, I'm going to go over uh, challenges that we face and that any developer might face when developing a PSP or launch title. Some of the approaches we took uh, to handling these challenges, some of our technology strategies, our content strategies, and then at the end, some overall PSP and launch tips. And we're going to try something new today. We're all going to be speaking simultaneously. So I ask you that you pay very good attention. But honestly, um, we've got a lot of content to, co to cover, so we're going to ask that you hold your questions until the end. Now, a launch title uh, will have to face many challenges that all other projects at a game developer will face. Um, but there are some additional things that you'll run up against. Uh, for one, you'll have incomplete or non-existent specs for a lot of hardware. Uh, when we started Spider-Man 2, uh, the PSP was spec'd at dual 333 megahertz CPUs with 32 meg, well, excuse me, with 8 megs of RAM, uh, which is a lot different from what consumers are going to have in their hands in a couple weeks, which is basically one 222 megahertz CPU with 24 megs of RAM and another CPU devoted to uh, decoding audio and video. Also, you'll have to deal with libraries and documentation that may not uh, exist, maybe in different languages, will be changing, uh, and you may or may not have release schedules for those upgrades. You'll also have to deal with new features that your artist will want to use, that you'll want to use for gameplay, things like your artist will want to use, or you'll have to decide whether or not your artist will be using patches to model things, how they're going to do that. You'll have to Tune your code for UMD performance when you may not know how fast a UMD performs compared to a DVD, networking, and, and things like that. And also, you'll, you may have to deal with delayed delivery of uh, hardware, uh, which we had to deal with on our PSP title. Uh, and this impacts all uh, across the boards developing a game, uh, from engineering, where you can't really performance tune until near the very end, uh, onto design, your designers don't have the actual form factor. It will be really hard for them to actually design the control scheme effectively. And the artists may not know what the LCD screen is going to look like, what colors look right, what the refresh is going to be, etc. Some other challenges you may face developing a launch title. Your launch date may be vague. You may just know, say, for instance, Q1 2005 or it may get pushed up or pushed back. So your schedule has to be flexible, has to be able to adjust either direction uh, without impacting the game significantly. Uh, your budget will also have some unknowns built into it. Uh, when we started our game, it was unknown whether or not PSP titles would require a PSX or a PS2 level budget. Staffing as well difficult to tell at the beginning of a project with unknown hardware how many people you're going to require to uh, accomplish your schedule, accomplish the required gameplay. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may have few tools at your disposal in your art pipeline, in your engineering pipeline to get all the content in your game. You may be dealing with compilers that are not yet able to deal with more advanced features of languages may not exist yet. Um, in the case of the Sony PSP, we were giving a software emulator which uh, approximated many of the, the features of the hardware. Uh, but in many cases, this is not a completely accurate portrayal of how, how the hardware would behave. And your QA, uh, your studio QA, or your developer QA, um, excuse me, your publisher QA, uh, will have to deal with the fact that there are really no TRC uh, guidelines at this point. 
This may or may not happen. It did happen for the PSP. So given all these challenges, how do we mitigate our risk? Well, uh, at Vicarious Visions, we, we typically look at things, a game development cycle in terms of three quantitative values, time, cost, and quality. And normally, you're able to, you're able to change two of those three. With a launch title, you really have no control over time. So your variables really are cost and quality. Now, nobody wants to put out a substandard game, so it's a balancing act between the cost of the development effort and the quality, basically, which means variety of levels, uh, depth of gameplay, number of features. So one of the ways that you will mitigate risk is by scoping back. And you, you'll want to do this earlier rather than later because typically you're not going to have enough time to adjust at the end of the project for gameplay. Now we use two different approaches on our two titles, Spider-Man and Asylum, that were uh, designed for PSP launch. For Spider-Man 2, um, we took an existing cross-platform engine uh, that had already shipped on GameCube, PS2, Xbox, and PC. <clears throat> this project began very soon after the PSP was, was announced. So our strategy was that we were going to take an already existing game, rip out all the content, use the content that we got from the first game as a basis for our new game content, uh, fill in the rest of the game with all new art, and add some gameplay features, uh, and we hope to hit our target. Asylum started uh, a few months after Spider-Man 2 had already been in production. So with that, we had lots of experience under our belt. At this point, uh, the emulator that Sony had given us had already been in-house, and we had had a, a bunch of things running on it. Um, and we had lots of knowledge from actually working with the PS PSP libraries themselves. We did a, we used a cross-platform approach on this title as well, although it was not using a cross-platform game engine, so to speak. We used our proprietary Alchemy middleware, uh, which had already shipped on, shipped games on PC, Xbox, PS2, GameCube. All the game content was new. The gameplay, the game engine code was from scratch, built from the ground up but we leveraged art from um, an external developer who had been working on a console version of the game. Now that I've gone over some of the challenges um, and the techniques that we use, I'm gonna hand things over to Brian, who's gonna go over some of the PSP tech that we use for Spider-Man 2. Hi. Um, I assume there's mostly programmers in the room, or at least quite a few. I'm just wondering, uh, by show of hands, who has worked on PS2 before? Yes, because I have a lot of comparison to PS2, so I want to make sure that things are uh, uh, understandable to at least most people. So, main thing, when we started out, we looked at the CPU and the bus, and early on, we, we assumed that you know we were going to get this 333 megahertz processor, everything was going to be really fast. We were hoping the cache would be all much better than PS2. We were hoping the bus would be plenty quick. Um, as it turns out, none of that is true. Uh, the CPU is basically running at 222. It has some other issues with the cache, whatever. So it does tend to be, on average, about half the speed of a PS2 if you're running normal code, um, give or take some amount. But that's probably where you should set your benchmark if you're looking at porting a PS2 game, for example, which is pretty much where we were starting. Um, once we came to realize that, we said, okay, well, we're going to have to deal with this. We have, you know, the solar bus, the solar CPU. We're probably going to be CPU bound, and it turns out we are. Um, the other problem is if you're used to working on PS2, you have all these extra chips laying around that you can sort of offload work to, the U1 being the most important. Um, you don't have that on PSP at all. There's pretty much no other chips except for the media engine, which you can use to offload your audio decoding and your music decoding. 
So you start to realize that you're going to have to do a lot of work on a CPU that isn't necessarily as fast as you might think. Um, one of the things that does help to mitigate that, though, is there's a VFPU, vector floating point unit, on the CPU. Um, it can't run fully asynchronously like VU1 can, but it has turned out to be a pretty cool surprise. Um, it's got, you know, an ample amount of register space, and you can basically use it to do a lot of your vector math. It's got a relatively steep but very short learning curve. Once you figure out how to use it, you know, you can use inline assembly, and we use that to solve a lot of our problems. Um, a lot of our physics code we fixed up to use that, a lot of our rendering code, skinning, all sorts of other things, um, and it became a, a pretty common component in a lot of our optimizations, especially at the late stage. So, you've got this memory, your, your CPU, and I mentioned the bus isn't that great, so that leads over to memory. Um, we started out and Matt mentioned we uh, we heard some numbers as low as 8 megs at one point. That got us a little worried because we were thinking our game needs to shrink down to 8 megs. Our final executable is 4 megs, so that wouldn't work very well. Um, as it turned out, we spent a bit of time reacting to the earlier numbers, but we kind of assumed that we'd see 32 megs once the system launched. We were mostly correct. The real number is 24 megs, give or take some... Uh, you know, some fudging in the numbers. Um, so what did we do to deal with that? And what can you do? Um, compressed geometry. Uh, if you, on most platforms, this is pretty common nowadays, shrink your vertex formats, fixed point vertices, you know, really, really packed normals, packed colors. We're down to like 16 bytes or less per vertex for all of our world geometry. Um, and the important thing to realize on PSP is that the bus is pretty much the bottleneck for everything. The CPU is only slow because it's hitting memory all the time and it's waiting on the bus and memory access is slow. So the bus is absolutely the number one bottleneck resource in the system. So if you shrink your geometry, you save memory, but you also save bus traffic because the GPU doesn't need to transfer as much data because there's only one bus and it's used by everything. So the less time that the GPU spends transferring vertices, the more time the CPU can spend doing real work. Um, so that helped us a lot on memory and on performance, but if you see that and say, oh, well, then I'll use index geometry too, just a quick note, don't do that. The second set of memory access for index geometry, um, you might be able to get away with it. Some people have done it, but as a rule, index geometry is three, five, ten times slower than non-indexed. Um, because there's no vertex cache on the GPU. So that uh, that 24 megs I mentioned, there's some possible fudging in the numbers. One of those things is VRAM. Um, that's not included in that 24 megs. There's basically two megs of embedded memory on chip, which is used as your VRAM, but it's actually, you can use it for anything. Um, unlike the PS2, where the VRAM is off chip and you gotta DMA things into it and you can't read it back, whatever. Um, the VRAM is completely mapped into the normal address space, and the CPU and the GPU go through the same memory controller. So everybody can read and write to VRAM or main memory at will. Um, this turns out to be really cool, because you can put textures in RAM, and you don't need to stream them. Um, when we started out, we said, okay, well, we've only got two megs of memory. We didn't know how cool the, the bus architecture was for that. We're like, we're going to have to put all of our textures in VRAM. After our frame buffers, we only have a meg left. Oh, man. All right, well, we'll tell the artists they only have a meg for all their textures in the level. Because we didn't want to write streaming for a launch title. That's going to be, you know, a new system we don't want to work on. Um, the artists were none too happy with that, as could be expected. But, like I said, the graphics chip can actually access textures directly from main memory. Um, and... The graphics chip has a really good texture cache that works pretty well. Eight kilobytes simply does what you would expect it to do. As long as more texture reads are still in the cache, it doesn't hit the bus anymore. So if your texture fits in cache, you basically pay the load price once and then you're done. And it doesn't matter where your texture is after that. So as long as your textures fit in cache, there's a very, very small performance difference 
keeping your textures in main memory versus keeping them in VRAM. And trying to allocate the memory out of VRAM for textures is a pain in the butt. You know, you've got to write some fancy allocator. You've got to deal with putting your highest priority textures there. So we just said we won't bother. We left all our textures in main memory. And I know for a fact many launch titles did this because it turns out to be totally acceptable. And that gave us another meg that we just used for other data instead. We put our display lists for the graphics chip and the extra memory instead, put some render targets, whatever. Um, and all that turned out to be pretty good because we ended up with over four megs, blowing our texture budget by a factor of four. Um, so we would have been in serious trouble otherwise. One other feature of the GPU is it supports DXT or S3TC texture compression. Um, leading up, the specs on this kept waffling. Yes, it'll have it. No, it won't. We kept crossing our fingers, hoping it would show up. Uh, then we finally got word it was in. We were so excited. I went and wrote a DDS loader like that morning. I was so happy. We like put everything into the game, we converted all of our textures, and then come to find out it runs awful. Um, don't use DXT on PSP ever. Um, it gets decompressed to 32 bits in the texture cache, so the texture cache pretty much fills up immediately, and all of your textures need to be as small as if they were 32 bit. Um, so don't do that. We went back to 4-bit and just used palletized for everything. Still looks great. So Sony ships a library with the PSP called LibGU, which is sort of their version of OpenGL for the PSP. Um, we started out, we had an engine that ran on Xbox, PS2, GameCube, whatever, and we said, all right, well, we're going to make an OpenGL version because we could kind of see things coming on the horizon. It's going to be OpenGL-like. So we made an OpenGL version for the PC, ported from the Xbox version, actually. Um, and that turned out to be one of the best things we ever did. Uh, it then made it very, very easy to maintain the OpenGL version and the LibGU version in parallel for a huge number of functions or whatever. It's pretty much text substitution, whether you're using the GL version or the LibGU version. Um, and it also... There's the emulator that you get from Sony, but they're discontinuing that. But the emulator doesn't really try to be an emulator. It's very, very not useful. Um, we pretty much made our OpenGL version into a better emulator than the Sony emulator ever was. We actually coded all of the sort of hardware quirks, the bizarre clipping behavior, anything that the PSP did strange, we tried to do in our OpenGL version as well. And that way, when we had a shortage of dev kits, all of our artists could still run the game on their PC, and they'd say, oh my god, all these polygons are dropping out, why can't I see the wall? And I'd say, well, that's because the polygon's too big and it's getting clipped and thrown out by the hardware. And they'd say, oh, okay, and then they could go fix it or you know, do whatever they needed to do. Um, so... We used LibGU for a really long time because, you know, the parallelism with the OpenGL worked out pretty nicely. Um, a lot of people got really obsessed about the performance in LibGU. We were kind of worried. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's not that slow. Uh, it's not really going to be the bottleneck. And if you want to replace it, it's very easy. I replaced it incrementally over a period of probably two weeks, and at no point during that was it ever broken. I just kept incrementally replacing functions with my own, and then eventually I get to the point where there's no scrap of libgu left in the game, but it's very easy to, to replace it with code that just builds DMA chains by hand or whatever, and it's certainly fast enough for whatever you're working on. So, <clears throat> the GPU, unlike the CPU, which we expected would be really fast, we kind of assumed the GPU would be slow. Um, we guessed wrong twice. Um, the GPU, you're probably going to be CPU bound. Now, there's sort of a, a hidden gotcha here that really they're both bound by the bus. So if one ends up saturating the bus, then the other one gets slow. So you can't look at it completely independently. But the graphics processor can do a pretty good job. And it can certainly handle more than enough polygons for the resolution of the screen that you're working on. Um, we started out and we said, okay, well, we're going to have to minimize vertex count. And then we said, well, maybe vertex versus skinned verts, because there's hardware skinning. The skinned verts are probably more expensive. So we started weighting those separately. Um, eventually, we understood the texture cache. So we had our artists resizing textures. Um, 
And we had an in-game system with budgets and displaying the numbers for all these and where we were relative to our targets so that the artists could load the game up and it would quickly highlight, you know, in red, oh, you're over the vertex count. Um, it's very important to have a system like that, especially on a launch title, but really in any game, so your artists have a good idea of what, uh, where they are relative to performance targets. Um, and it should probably be flexible because on a launch title, those performance targets are changing when you realize new things about the hardware. Um, we actually didn't hit all of our targets, like the memory number I mentioned for uh, textures, things like that. But, like I said, the GPU was never really the bottleneck. We're CPU bound. Um, things came out pretty good. So early aggressive optimization may have gone overboard in some cases, but um, it, it worked out for the best. So the last major thing here, if you've worked on PS2, you're familiar with Sony's idea of clipping, um, or lack thereof. So the PSP, when it was announced, it was, hey, it has hardware clipping, and we all thought, oh, great, we don't need to worry about it this time. That's wonderful. Um, as it turns out, it has near plane clipping and nothing else. So you still have to deal with the guard band. Um, basically, any triangle that's big enough to extend outside the camera a sufficient distance, which is shorter the closer you get to the camera, uh, just doesn't draw. And that's a pretty serious problem because in a lot of game types, like first-person shooters where you have walls, third-person action games, like Spider-Man, you have a lot of large polygons. Um, and you need to deal with those in some way. So with the, on PS2, you have VU1, and that does all you can write your clipper on there. Everything's good if you want to go that route. Um, we didn't have VU1, so we thought uh, we probably shouldn't do software clipping. That's going to be yet more work that we can't afford. So the PSP has patches, and everybody's so happy about patch support and curved surfaces. This is going to be great. I had this amazing brainstorm. I was convinced I was so brilliant. Uh, I'm an idiot. So... We have, you know, city environments, and there's these huge, huge sides of buildings, these big quadrilaterals. And I said, hey, how about if I just take the side of the building and make it into a patch? And then I can tessellate it dynamically, depending on the distance from the camera, and everything will work great, because you can set the subdivision level for the patches. I'm like, wonderful. Um, the problem is, if you look at some of our levels, there's a lot of buildings, and there's a lot of large quadrilaterals, and a lot of large polygons in general. And since you can't stitch patches, you have ridiculously high primitive counts, and that per primitive cost is very high on the PSP. We ended up stitching our triangle strips completely because you really don't want to be calling, making draw calls repeatedly. So the per primitive cost killed us, and that got pulled out. So then I said, all right, well, we'll just subdivide everything offline, uh, tessellate stuff down to a sufficiently small level. But because of our camera, which gets right in next to the character, the near plane's really close. The camera can get right next to the geometry. We had all kinds of other problems. We said, oh, that's not going to work because we'd have to subdivide the side of a skyscraper down to like, you know, one meter or like 10 centimeter, whatever, uh, triangles. And we'd have like thousands and thousands of triangles for the side of one building. That's not going to work either. Uh, so then I just wrote a software clipper. Um, and I was totally convinced it was never going to work. I'm like, this is a horrible idea. Um, I got the inspiration from somebody at another company. We, I banged it out in over a weekend or two. My first time writing a clipper, it just sort of worked. I sped it up a bunch by using the VFPU, which, like I said, is awesome. And now it just sort of works. Um, my expectation is that many or most games will end up with a software clipper. You can see the artifacts in a lot of the shipping Japanese titles already. Um, I, I think it's pretty much necessary. Um, Sony of America product development support or R&D or whatever is writing a software clipper. I've seen it. Um, if you are uncomfortable writing one, you can probably just take their code and modify it and it would be good enough for your needs. But unless your game design involves a camera that stays like a mile away from all your geometry, or is in 2D or something, you're probably going to want one. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron now, who's going to talk about some other tech issues, higher level stuff from Asylum. So Brian covered the low level pretty well. Um, I'm just going to talk about some of the differences at a higher level with Asylum. Um, so first, a little bit about the technology base of Asylum. 
Um, we were an Alchemy-based project, as Matt mentioned earlier, and Alchemy is a middleware platform, and it's used for cross-platform development. Um, at the time that our project was started, the emulator was already available, so we had a pretty good idea of what we actually needed to do at the low level. And all that we had to do is write some sub functions um, in Alchemy down at the bottom level, and we were basically up and running very quickly. Um, other things that um, we used Alchemy for, the main things that we used Alchemy for were memory management, um, rendering uh, via scene graph, and this turned out to be a very good thing for us because we could optimize our data however we wanted just by modifying our scene graph hierarchy, um, which we, which Alchemy has several tools to do. Um, and the last thing was FileIO, our last main thing. Um, other than that, um, a lot of our upper level systems were very data driven so we could make lots of changes and tweaks which was very important for like game design. Game designers could go in and modify the data and have a build of the game up and running without very many code changes. Um, our data was XML based and it was able to be converted into binary files in like a pre-processed step. Um, so there, there's some of the systems that used it, and I'll probably talk about one of them in a little bit. So other than that, um, we had uh, basically 2D gameplay, but in a 3D world. Um, we would build a 3D level and wrap a, a spline through it, and then all the gameplay took place along that spline, but yet we could still have um, like realistic-looking 3D environments. Um, which turned out to work out very well. Um, our camera turned out to be one of our greatest assets um, since it was largely 2D. Um, it, we had it be largely a side view, and it would follow along. The, it would follow the player along along a spline, and that led to several performance increases. Um, we didn't need to sort any of our geometry. Um, because we could just pre-sort them in a data step and have them just in the correct order and then have no software sorting. We didn't need to do, we didn't need a clipper, we didn't need a software clipper like Spidey had um, because the camera was basically predetermined along certain segments and if triangles dropped out, we just tessellated those specific pieces of geometry. Um, and the last thing that greatly helped us was a very simple PBS system. Since we knew how the camera would move, we could partition our world up very easily and then just not draw the sections that were relevant to the current camera view. Um, other things, overall our project ran fairly smoothly. Um, we had a great deal of collaboration between our entire team. Um, we had a few minor, we had some challenges though um, our development team was split up on the East Coast and the West Coast, so we had time differences and transferring data across the coast and some communication things to deal with, but nothing too hard to deal with. Um, aside from that, we were able to leverage a bunch of Spidey's code. Um, most notably was um, audio, video, and VFU. Um, these at least the audio and video code were written so that um, they could run standalone or they could fit into the Alchemy um, underlying API. Um, so we were able to just take large segments of code and just directly use them. Um, BFTU, um, we didn't, we haven't used that yet and it will probably be very straightforward because a lot of lower level things that it was used for were like math operations and we can just block replace some functions. Um, this is a huge benefit to our schedule. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our art style. Um, the 
as I mentioned a little bit before, that we wanted our game to look realistic um, and very high detail. Um, so those were some of the main goal, main artistic goals. Here are some of the other ones that we had. We wanted very high contrast and to have a lot of lighting effects. Um, if we notice, like, it's a little difficult to see, but there's a chair there with, like, a shadow, and the shadow is basically baked into the geometry. So, yeah. Um, we also wanted to have um, visible light sources and lots of contrast. Um, and um, these screenshots here are basically prototypes that the artists have mocked up in order to try to achieve some of the look. Um, so here's some other mock-ups that we have um, trying to achieve that realistic look. If we look, you can see um, how we have the wall reflected through the floor, and that's the standard mirroring the geometry with some alpha tricks. And, of course, no game is complete nowadays without high dynamic range. Um, so. so one of the tools that uh, both projects actually used uh, that were the most beneficial uh, was the build machine. Now, this was a uh, a concept that I'd come up with for our project after noting the trend of every project that I worked on that got bigger. I started on Game Boy Color projects, which were, you know, maybe two or three people uh, moved up through Game Boy Advance and Game Boy uh, DS, uh, Nintendo DS, I'm sorry. Um, as the projects got bigger and there were more people on the team, there were more uh, sort of menial tasks that needed to be done on a daily basis, keeping the build running, uh, getting new people on the project up to speed with the build, uh, things such as that. So what I wanted the, the build machine to be was sort of a way to relieve some of the menial tasks from the lead engineer position, uh, and also to be sort of a watchdog, a, a big brother uh, for everyone watching on the, uh, for everyone working on the project. So the first design goal of the build machine was to uh, monitor the code integrity. Now the way this was done is we used uh, a build system uh, that was based on Jam, which is sort of a make clone with uh, some different syntax and some more advanced language features. And once you get it set up, it's, it's really easy to use and uh, it just kind of works. And our source control uh, is Perforce, and that also allowed us to do some of this stuff. But basically, our build machine was uh, running a Perl script which monitored all check-ins. And once it noticed that something was checked in, it would build. And it would just keep building, and that was its job. Uh, so that was its way of maintaining code integrity. Same way it would manage, I wanted it to manage assets. I wanted any problems with, with art, uh, you know, artists going over budget, poly counts, memory, texture, whatever. I wanted that to be monitored by the build machine as well. Uh, this was really important to the Spider-Man 2 project because we were dealing with an offshore art team that was eight hours ahead of us. So as they were finishing their work day, we were just coming in. So if we had done something before we had left the previous day, that had broken the build, they'd pretty much be dead in the water for an entire day. So I wanted to reduce the possibility of having any team downtime <clears throat> out of the office or within and ultimately reduce my workload so that I could actually do engineering work rather than making builds, the stuff that nobody really wants to do. Hey, that's what machines are good for. <clears throat> so I mentioned the offshore art team. Uh, keeping them up to date as well as in sync with everything we're working on, and likewise, keeping us synced up with their latest work. That was uh, one of the issues that this machine would have to deal with. And again, you know, I'll plug Perforce because it did a great job for us. They have a concept of a proxy server, which uh, basically you set up a machine which is a proxy for the 
main source control depot, and then your remote team will just, this, is, this machine is at the remote team's location, and they just check in and check out, and the proxy server will cache files <clears throat> and get them and send them back to the main server as, as necessary. That was a great help to us. Once it was set up again, another thing that just sort of worked and we never thought about it again. Another reason that uh, keeping code and assets synced up was important was because the Spider-Man 2 scripting system was very advanced. <clears throat> it was basically a C++ style language that would compile to a script executable, which would run through a, a Java-like virtual machine in-game. And script could call into code just as code could call into script. So if ever a scripter had um, an executable which was not up to date with the latest functionality in the various files which exported libraries to one another, I mean, that anything could really happen. So it was very important that everybody had synchronized executables, synchronized scripts, etc. We also had on our project multiple build configurations. Now, we mainly supported PC, OpenGL, to emulate uh, the PSP. First, to emulate it until we got the hardware, and second, to emulate it for those of us on the team who didn't have the dev kits. We really only had a handful, and exporting laws pre prevented us from sending them to our offshore art team. So our art team actually never saw the game on a PSP. So it was very important for our <clears throat> PC version to run very closely to the PSP version, so we were always updating that. Also, not all of our engineers actually had versions of our compiler because the licensing was very expensive. So again, the PC version, it was important that that was maintained. And I mentioned the, the hardware dev kit shortage. So on the code side of things, <clears throat> as I said earlier in the introduction, the Perl script, which is running on the build machine, would, would basically pull Perforce at regular intervals. I forget what it was, but it was less than five seconds. So you could check something in and, and watch it start working. It would monitor the check-in, and then it would build all configurations. This is PC debug release and PSP debug release under two different compilers for PSP, so a total of six configurations. If compile failed for any reason, it would send an email to all engineers on the team. And uh, here's where there's a slight bit of humor. It would attempt to deduce who was to blame by checking the history of check-ins for that project under the source tree and blame that person right at the top of the email. So. Really, nobody wanted to, to be blamed too much for breaking the build. This came, uh, this was inspired by the company that we took the, the source code for the engine from. They actually, after a certain number of uh, compile breaks, would ban, would blacklist engineers from making any source control check-ins. I thought that was a bit extreme, especially because at the, the time we only had two engineers. <laughs> Pretty soon. Nobody would be checking anything in. We'd all be blacklisted. So I thought, you know, a mild poking of, of blame would, would be sufficient. So nobody was really checking in any crap code because nobody wanted to be blamed for anything. Uh, but at the same time, nobody has time in the day on, for a launch title to test six configurations. So if you, you know, inadvertently broke something because some header wasn't included, for one build configuration, it was not the end of the world. Perforce also has a very uh, powerful labeling system. After every successful build, we just simply updated a label with all the source code files in the project. This means that at any point, if we realize that, oh, on Thursday, you know, Spidey stopped shooting his web ball, and it's not an art thing, we could just simply walk through all the labels, figure out when it broke, and we'd have a, a perfectly reproducible snapshot of the code at any, at any time. It was very, very useful. Also, after a successful smoke test, which I'll get into uh, in the next couple slides, it would check in PC executables. 
this, again, was very, very important for our offshore team because they needed to have the latest and greatest executables at all times. So any features that we added, uh, a lot of times, especially in the middle of the project, we'd add features that were very closely tied to art changes. So they really needed to have the latest executables. This way, you know, if if something crashed, basically if a scripter came to me and said there had, had a crash, I would just say, we'll get latest. And 99% of the time that fixed everything. So it was something that nobody had to think about. Executables were just always there. And also, we had a network share where once everything was working, once the, the build machine had made it through successful smoke test, <clears throat> it would share everything out. So everyone had access to the latest everything at all points. For assets, we kept intermediate assets in the live section of our Perforce depot. We had another section uh, not necessary for anyone who was building where they kept all the source max files. But basically, we kept what I call level zero and level one assets, which was basically anything either zero or one degree away from the source art. Uh, max files were not kept here because they would require an artist to actively export something. Uh, and the plugin that would, the plugin exporter would actually do the checking into Perforce. The second type of thing that was kept uh, in the assets uh, portion of the depot were source textures, source audio files, anything that was platform independent. And then there were so also some hand-authored data files. The data building process was, we didn't use JAM, unfortunately, because of the architecture of some of the, the data that we inherited, but it was a very simple uh, batch file-driven build system. Anyone could just click on the <clears throat> make data batch file, and they had the latest version of all the data provided they had gotten it from Perforce. And that just sort of worked for everybody. There were no other tools involved. Uh, with the exception of one, <clears throat> and that was our texture conversion. We have a very expensive uh, image palletization and quant quantization uh, program, which does an incredible job. But it's very expensive. <clears throat> and there was no way we were going to license this for everyone on the team. So basically we said, all right, the build machine is the artist now. Put the hardware dongle on the build machine, have it, again, do some more monitoring of files. Anytime anyone checked in a source texture, it would check all the textures out, convert them all, revert all the textures that didn't change, and then check in any changed ones. Work like a charm. Of course, <clears throat> when you automate things to that level, you, uh, you give up. Excuse me. <clears throat> we don't have the best weather on the East Coast. Not, none of the 70 degrees every day stuff, so I'm a little under the weather. You give up a little bit of your control when you automate things to that degree, but 99% of the textures converted automatically was fine. We just special case the other 1%. Then we come to smoke test. After all the assets have been converted, we basically, in series, try and load every level in the game and let the game play for a certain number of seconds. Two, five, ten, doesn't really matter. Uh, if it failed for any reason, an email was sent. This could be an assertion, this could be an out-of-memory error, this could be missing asset. Again, just some feedback, live feedback, immediate feedback, so that people would know, people would be aware immediately that something was wrong. And this caught, I mean, we never had a, a situation where something was sent off and then we realized, oh my God, we forgot to, you know, put the Spider-Man model in this, this build. Everything was caught almost immediately, solved about 95% of our problems with assets. And the final thing that, that the build machine got for us saved a ton of time with publisher builds. Now, a lot of projects I've been on, E3 builds, demo builds, these are huge sort of milestones that build up a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety on teams. 
they're basically mini milestones that everybody starts to crunch for. Oh God, we have that publisher bill that's due on Friday. And I try and avoid these whenever possible because they lead to last minute hacks that 95% of them end up staying or get removed and you, it just becomes a mess. So <clears throat> with the build machine, we had a perfectly working build guaranteed at any point in time, really. After the game had been smoke tested, it would just copy it off into a directory and that build worked. If there was a problem, nothing would get copied into the directory. So this was our perfect avenue towards a zero effort publisher build. Have the build machine after it runs the the smoke test and it and it succeeds, zip everything up and FTP it to the publisher. It was amazing. Completely transparent to the team. Nobody ever had to worry, sweat about anything. And the amount of discipline that it instilled in everyone to not ever check in any crap code, bad textures, anything like that. It was really remarkable, and I, I, I highly, highly pushed this idea. It was amazing. Now I'm going to hand it over to Aaron again. He's going to talk about the Asylum Build system. So we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to be moving through the stuff a little bit quicker. Um, so we learned a lot from the Spidey system, and we actually wrote a, a more generic build system, which has now been adopted on most of the projects in our studio. Um, it's basically built upon a script method where we write configuration scripts, and then the build machine runs through them. Um, Unlike Spidey, we had ours based on a time schedule. It would kick off a build every two hours, and we would have actually two configuration scripts, one that would run every two hours throughout the day, and then one that did a full rebuild of all code and data at midnight. Um, we also had to, we also had a custom Perforce client um, to alleviate some of the problems that Spidey had with checking out all of the textures, making the conversion, reverting all the ones that we didn't change. So we had a custom client that would be able to track what things would change and only check those out and check those back in and also have a system for protecting like local artist data if they were in the middle of changing certain pieces of assets and started syncing and stuff. But in general, um, our build machine if we wanted to have more steps throughout the build process, we didn't need to have any new code. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about interruption in a second. So we also had a build dashboard. Um, this is an example of what the web page would look like um, at a given time, and it showed the status of the current build and previous builds. The, um, the rows represent a build and the columns represent a build step. <laughs> if, the, if the thing is green, that means everything was good. If it's red, that means that the step failed. And if it's yellow, that means that the step completed, but with warnings. Um, so like if you notice in the data step, there's a bunch of little boxes for the step. Those correspond to like a level, and certain ones are yellow. Um, in, in that case, we went over budget in that level, and it would require some asset reduction. Um, we were also able to start our build at any time. Um, the bottom build failed in the fifth step there, but we were able to skip some of the early steps and just restart it and fix up the problems that it had to finish it. Um, each box was also a link to where we could get detailed statistics about that individual item. Um, and the time below it was the time that step took. So now a little bit about Asylum Art. Um, we set our art budgets very early, um, and that turned out to help us a great deal. Um, we gave a general block of memory for any per-level assets, um, but then we didn't really specify beyond that memory chunk what the artist needed to do with that amount of memory. And that led to quite a bit of freedom from the artist's standpoint. Um, if they needed more 
texture detail in this particular area, then they put more textures in, or if they needed more geometry or they wanted certain scripted sequences to go on, they had the ability to be flexible and change that out. Um, all of our textures were also made cache friendly and yeah. Um, as mentioned before, we got our we were able to use some assets from an external source. Um, for the most part, this was mostly positive. It saved a lot on production time, but we ran into a few hiccups as the assets were in a much higher detail level than we could afford. Um, so we had to do lots of texture reduction, um, not only for detail, but also to make them cache friendly, um, reducing vert and bone counts of like geometry and actors, and then fixing up some geometry to make it skinnable. Um, we had some geometry that was like fanned and then some that had like turned edges and some other random stuff. And now I'm gonna switch quickly back to Brian. Um, yeah, so just a couple more slides and we're almost done. Um, very similar to what Aaron was just talking about, we had a large amount of pre-existing art from the Spider-Man 1 movie game that Treyarch did. Um, but of course that art was all geared at console that we couldn't quite deal with on the PSP and also you don't really need that much detail for the small screen. So we spent most of our time optimizing the art, trying to downsize it and creating new levels sort of based on the old stuff. But um, with a heavy focus on limiting, you know, how much we were going to push the hardware because we still didn't know what we could pull off. Um, unfortunately, we spent a lot of time, we didn't fully understand the hardware or the engine that we were working with because it was new to us. Um, so we spent a lot of time sort of telling the artist to do something without understanding the consequences. That was a bad idea. Um, and also Matt mentioned we got outside artists that never got the hardware. That's a problem. Um, one of the main things, though, that I want to mention is the LCD. Um, the PSP is 16 by 9, just like a lot of upcoming consoles um, that you may know about. So it is very different from 4x3. Uh, it has impact on performance because your field of view is different, so how much stuff you're drawing is different. It has an impact on the field of the game because of the field of view and the, the wide aspect ratio. Um, we really didn't make any steps at all to deal with that. We sort of got lucky that we just sort of adjusted the camera and everything worked out okay, but you absolutely positively should think about the design and art impact of the wide aspect ratio early in the process and figure out how it affects your game design and how it affects your art. Um, the color and behavior and the refresh on the LCD, we, uh, we got our hopes up with some early LCDs and then we got shattered and then they got better again. Um, the final LCD is pretty good. It's got some refresh issues that you really, really need to see your art on to understand. Um, and, I mean, we had four different revs of LCD by the time we shipped because they were, Sony was giving us new hardware constantly. Um, but ultimately what it comes down to is on something like the PSP LCD where it might not be, it's certainly not going to be the same as a CRT and it's probably very different even from LCD monitors you have. You really need to evaluate all of your content, your FMV, your UI, and your in-game stuff to understand how it's going to look and how it's going to behave on the, the LCD. Um, and finally, I mentioned we had, you know, an old uh, engine and tools that had been abandoned by their original authors. Um, started out with a quirky exporter. We made it worse by removing features from the engine, but not removing the switches and knobs from the exporter, which made the artists very confused when every day they would come into my office and say, I checked this box and it doesn't do anything. And I said, you're right, it doesn't do anything. Um, and then they walked away scratching their heads. Um, so... You really want your pipeline to be as tight as possible, especially on a launch title where you're going to be asking your artists to make changes to accommodate hardware spec changes. Um, things need to be reactive. And that we absolutely positively failed. We should have spent more time fixing up our exporter and our tools earlier. Um, fortunately, most of what we needed to do to our art was done as a step in between the exporter and the game. So I was able to do it without having to bug the artists, but that was pretty much luck. So learn from my mistake. So I'm going to cover everything as fast as these slides do. A uh, couple of effective strategies for launch. If you're aiming for launch, you want to mitigate all risks via scheduling. Do everything in Microsoft Project so you can see interdependencies. Don't just have an Excel spreadsheet. 
budget conservatively, know where you can embellish things, know where you can cut things, and they won't affect your game's story, your game's progression. Have a build machine. You must. You have to. I'm going to be watching all of you. Uh, build on multiple platforms, multiple compilers, as much as you can. And project synergy. Because, I mean, this was kind of luck that our two projects were working in parallel, but one of the most impressive visual things that that we hear feedback about in our game uh, is a technique that we stole from the Asylum Project. Here's a screenshot of what our game looked like before, and look at Spidey afterwards, before, afterwards. This is a rim lighting technique. It's a uh, theatrical movie technique that Asylum was using, and we completely lifted the idea. It took about half a day to implement, and it looks great. So if you have other projects to draw inspiration from, do it. Uh, and just a couple PSP tips. As Brian said, use LibGU, use the VFPU. It's great, it's fast, it does lots of cool math things. Um, exploit the flexible memory model. Put your textures in VRAM if you want. Put display lists in VRAM. Put code in VRAM if you want. Uh, and keep your bottlenecks in mind. There's one bus, it's short, it makes everybody slow. Uh, virtual functions are bad if you love C++ as we do. Um, so if you're porting code that's from uh, PS2 or from another platform that has a faster CPU, be careful. Uh, you will just try not to touch memory ever. Uh, and it looks like we have approximately three seconds for questions. We have a few minutes, so uh, if there's any out there. Yes? question was uh, about our artists being off-site and not having access to PSP hardware. Did we have any problems with uh, their artwork not being appropriate? Um, actually, we had some at the beginning uh, where uh, lighting uh, was perhaps not appropriate as they were all using uh, actual CRT monitors, different than the actual LCDs. Uh, but we, had, we actually had the benefit of having a really great uh, visual art lead on this project who directed basically the, the artistic look of the game and was in constant contact with the art team. So that was sort of like a continuous rolling feedback process that, that uh, worked out really well. Yes? To what extent did you have to diminish PS2 assets to get them running well on PSP? The question was, uh, to what extent do we have to diminish PS2 assets to get them to run on PSP? Um... So the final Spider-Man model was, what, about 1,200 polys, um, which was down quite a bit. Um, the textures basically have 8K or, say, 4K with MIP maps. I mean, if any texture fits in that. So we, most of our textures were like 128 by 128, 4-bit. Um, it, you know, it, it's a little bit of a trade-off here and there, depending on what you want to do. But um, really, any reduction that you do to get things running are things that you would probably want to do anyway, given the relative resolution and screen size of the PSP versus a TV running at 640 by 448. The question was, uh, the person who asked the question had heard rumors of TRC issues regarding battery life. Um, not sure if we're allowed to talk about TRC stuff, really, but we didn't have... Yeah, they, they were pretty lenient with launch titles. Um, seeing as we don't have final hardware other than one actual Japanese imported uh, unit, we don't really know how fast our game chews through the battery. But they were pretty lenient on that. Yes? A couple questions. Uh, first of all, the uh, software cookies, uh, you said that they were kind of all-part performance kits that you had in the kind of before and after the CSU. And the other question I had is really, where were your biggest wins on the CSU? Okay. 
questions were uh, VFPU Clipper, what were the uh, ballpark performance hits before and after VFT, VFPU optimization, and where were the biggest wins? Second question was, where are the biggest wins using the VFPU? I'll let Brian answer this. Um, so in the final game, in average scenes, the Clipper takes maybe two milliseconds a frame or something. Um, the VFPU, when I implemented it, say the original one I was testing maybe the CPU-like version was testing maybe 500, 600 verts per millisecond, which was pretty bad. Um, and then I spent a lot of time optimizing it with the VFPU and ended up closer to 1,500 to 2,000 verts a millisecond, which is still not optimal. I know of other people that are pushing like 4,000 with even better code. Um, but the VFPU easily sped up my clipper by a factor of two or three. Um, other areas, the skinning, um, Basically, whenever we had like long sequences of matrix operations um, and a few other things like uh, quaternion slurp or other things that are normally implemented in in the math libraries that you get with your compiler are implemented in you know software badly. Um, there's a lot of nice approximation instructions on the VFPU for trig functions, so you can implement slurp way faster on the VFPU, like factor of two or three over the, you know, what you normally do. Um, so that was a big one. But yeah, um, mostly because you have enough register space that you can minimize uh, memory access. So if you're walking through matrices doing, you know, concatenating all your bone matrices for the frame, that was the sort of stuff where it helped a lot. And this will probably be our last question. Right in the back. <laughs> A uh, question was how much uh, rough ballpark estimate were we able to speed the game up from the initial port? The first time it ran on hardware? First time we got the game up, I think it was running around two, between two and four frames per second. Um, we like to say that our game runs at 30 frames per second. But sometimes those numbers don't have as many threes <laughs> in them. But it was quite a bit. I mean, and that wasn't that wasn't really all code and VFU. A lot of it was really uh, data organization. Um, there was a whole lot of, of code rewriting, not because the engine that we got was excessively slow, but there were a lot of things that were not PSP friendly. Let's say that yeah. way. And, and that's probably one of the, the biggest gotchas with porting code bases that were not designed for bus limited architecture. Yeah, and also the original code, of course, in a lot of performance critical areas had specific assembly paths for PS2, Xbox, GameCube. And when we went back to PSP, we didn't have anything yet. So we had to sort of re-implement hardware specific code for some of the performance critical areas. Well, thank you for coming for our talk. Appreciate it.